This morning is going to be uh, more like a meditation, I would say, than a sermon. But I hope that you enjoy it, for it's going to look at God's Word through a different filter and hopefully provoke, provoke some interesting thought that will impact your, your Christian life. I enjoyed uh, putting it together. Job chapter 12, verses 7 to 10. But ask the animals, and they will teach you. Or the birds in the sky, and they will tell you. Or speak to the earth, and it will teach you. Or let the fish in the sea inform you. Which all of these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this. In his hand is the life of every creature, and the breath of all mankind. Ron, in this microphone here, the high end, if you would just turn it back a little bit to take the S's out. So here we have a scripture verse where we're encouraged to inquire of the creatures in this living world. In other words, God has left an impression of himself in every created thing. There are traces of the maker. So for fun this morning, consider the skeleton of a sail cat fish. I have one of these at home. Have you ever seen this before? This is really impressive. I meant to bring it, but like so many other things, this morning, nothing is going smooth. But that's always a good sign to me as well, that something good is intended to happen. In this, the skeleton of this fish, if you hold it up, Jesus' body is outlined on the cross. In actually significant detail. And when you shake the cross, you will actually, or shake this, the skeleton, you'll hear dice. It just, it rattles. Which uh, theologians and people from ancient times spiritual, have brought spiritual meaning into it, thinking it was the dice, or symbolizing the dice that was used to gamble over Jesus' clothes. And if you turn it around, it looks like the Roman shield. It's really quite remarkable. But then consider the sand dollar as well. The sand dollar is a, an ocean animal that is uh, related to the starfish and the sea urchin. It lives slightly buried in the sand along the coastal waters, the shores. On the top of the surface you're going to find holes in it. And through the centuries people have felt that it symbolizes the star of Bethlehem. Again, like the, the skeletal remains of the sailfish, if you shake it, it rattles. If you open it up, you get something that looks like five doves or peace doves. The passion flower. You seen that before? Of course. So named because so many aspects of it are understood to symbolize the passion of Christ, the sufferings of Jesus. The three stigmata represent the three nails. The ten petals are understood to be the ten faithful disciples, minus, of course, Judas and Peter who denied the Lord. The tendrils represent the whips for flagellation, and the radial filaments, which are over a hundred, represent the crown of thorns. And there's more and more layers of meaning that people have seen in what has become known as the passion flower. And so it goes, finding spiritual meaning in the created world. Well, Jesus in his Sermon on the Mount said, Consider the birds. And with that, lovers of God have meditated on the virtues of bird species and looked for spiritual inspiration amongst them. So this morning, consider the pelican. How many of you are familiar with the spiritual significance of the pelican? Anybody? Not even you, Jackie? You should be. You ancient Catholic Q. Oh, you. <laughs> you talk about it and it'll come back. You actually, you will recognize it as we go forward. As I drove here today, I saw a pelican in one of my neighbor's yards. Not a, not a real one. Oh. <laughs> a concrete one. This is interesting. Dante, Shakespeare, Thomas Aquinas. All reference the pelican as a symbol of Jesus. Thomas Aquinas wrote, O loving pelican, 
O Jesus, Lord. In fact, you will find the symbol of the pelican consistently used from the time of the early church fathers right through to the Renaissance. And we'll even see remnants of it around today. You'll see it in church masonry. You'll see it on stained glass. <coughs> You'll see it in all sorts of iconic religious work. It's there. So consider the pelican. As a bird, the pelican is at best unusual. It looks like something that along with the crocodile slipped into our era from prehistoric times. In fact, pelican fossils have actually been found amongst dinosaur fossils in the same strata. So that gives you an indication that they are believed to come from that same time period. Regardless, it's a different kind of bird. It's a water bird, huge and heavy. Their beaks are longer than any other living bird. Their throat, its most distinctive feature, expands, and when it does, it's complete with a three-gallon expandable pouch. I want you to watch something. Do you have that for us there, Ron? Oh, precious pelican, Jesus our Lord. It's a volume there, too. sometimes. Well, you saw the idea. A pigeon was swallow, or a pelican was swallowing a pigeon hole. Now, what you were about to see was two minutes of agonizing pigeon fighting, excruciating, feathers flapping, seeing it try to get back out, swallowed right on down. Aren't you glad you missed that? <laughs> you would have, actually, it looks humorous, although gruesome at the same time. The point being, Thomas Aquinas wrote, O loving pelican, Jesus our Lord. Are you wondering what the basis was for the pelican becoming such a dear symbol of Jesus? For this is just a taste of those who found the, the symbolism. The, the pelican is insignificantly mentioned in the Bible numerous times. I'm like a pelican all alone in the wilderness. That's one random reference. It is one of the birds... In, in, in the Levitical laws, it's considered an abomination. In 1909, Gene Stratton Porter wrote that of all the biblical birds, perching pelicans are the ugliest. Ornithologists call them stupid, ponderous, undemonstrative, grotesque, gawky, awkward, comical. When they fly, yes, they do assume a certain grace, but to be a bird that symbolizes Christ, well, that seems a little far-fetched. But never mind. The pelican has in fact been one of the legendary symbols, symbols of the Christian faith. The Hebrew word for God's steadfast love is hesed. Hesed. It's mostly translated mercy in the scriptures, but the illustration that is conjured up is that of a mother pelican caring for her young. And the mother pelican pierces her own chest so that her blood spills out and, and feeds her chicks so that they can survive. Talk about an image of sacrificial love. This is what moved the poets and theologians alike to identify the pelican with Christ. That blood would be spilled to render life for its own. Now with that being said, I might go and have a pelican tattooed on this forum. What do you think? Good idea? Some of you are shaking no. Well, I'll tell you the problem, even if you thought it was a decent idea. At the point of history when the pelican was elevated as a symbol of Jesus and sacrificial love, science was not at the forefront of people's thinking. Observations were often inaccurate. And while the pelican may have something to teach us, the belief that the pelican actually pierced her chest so that her blood 
would empower and bring strength to her young is simply not true. It's inaccurate. It has never happened. It is true that in some species of pelicans, their chest turned reddish in the spring, and maybe without binoculars, in a quest to find something inspirational, it led to the idea that she might have pierced her chest. But it's, not, it's just not true. The image of a pious pelican on stained glass windows, chalices, tapestries, and monastery doors is based on a lie, maybe well-intentioned, but it's still a lie. It's not true. Another version of the legend was that the mother fed her dying young with her blood to revive them from death, but in turn lost her own life. But that's not true either. Sounds wonderful, but it's just not right. Jesus told us to pursue the truth. He said, I will lead my spirit who will guide you into all truth. He said, you shall know the truth and it shall set you free. So we need to be a people who hold and inspire our faith to what is real, not what is make-believe. Agreed? So while Jesus said, consider the birds, of which the pelican is included, I think maybe the first thing we could learn today, that in our, pursuit of tr in our pursuit of truth, there might be some things that we need to unlearn. Let's think about that. For example, Does the Bible teach that three wise men visited Jesus after his birth? It does not. There were three gifts that were presented to Jesus, but it in no way is this three wise men. So what? Was Jonah really swallowed by a whale? It doesn't say that in Scripture. So it's a fish, a big fish. A whale's a mammal. A fish, not. Was it Delilah who cut Samson's hair? No. It was her servant. <coughs> so what? These things aren't a big deal. But maybe they are bigger than you think. Because aren't we supposed to be a people of truth? Integrity with the truth is core to the foundation of who we are. And credibility in our witness matters a lot. If we are proposing certain things that are inconsistent with Scripture as if they are truth and yet they're not, why would somebody else believe anything else we say? Loose with the facts? Why would any clear person believe anything else we say? There might be some other things that we might need to unlearn. The word rapture the Jehovah's Witnesses are right, it's not in the Bible. When they come to your door and they raise the subject, they are absolutely correct. The word rapture is not in the Bible. The teaching about being caught up with the Lord when He comes is, but the word itself is not. The Bible in no place condemns drinking alcohol. When I became a Christian, I had all these Pentecostal people telling me the Bible says you can't drink. Well, you may have a personal conviction about not drinking alcohol, and that's fine, I would respect that, but never say that the Bible says it's wrong. It does condemn drunkenness. That's an altogether different issue. But Jesus turned water into wine, a little wine for their stomach's sake. Scriptures are filled with allusions to, to wine. So sometimes we need to unlearn some things. The Bible does not say God helps those who help themselves. Benjamin Franklin said that but not God. And why do we argue about the age of the earth? Four thousand years old? Or billions of years old? The truth of it is, is none of us have any idea. That's the bottom line. So why would we argue that as if we know? There are some things we need to unlearn. Who wrote the Pentateuch? For many years, we were all taught that the first five books of the Bible are the books of Moses. Well, that is actually impossible because Moses' death and his burial is recorded in those books. Unless he was able to reach beyond the grave, and was Moses even literate? We knew he grew up in Egypt, hieroglyphics, 
But the alphabet wasn't even invented to many years after that. So there's some things that we need to unlearn. And if we say things as if they're fact, when a clear-thinking person knows that they're not, it erodes the rest of our testimony. It erodes the credibility of our witness. So if so the thing about the pelican, you may not have ever bought into the legend of the pelican, but many people have. And it's based on a lie. And yet it's chiseled in stone. It's, it's reflected in, in cathedral stained glass windows. It's, in, it's, in, it's on tapestries all over the world. When, in the early 1990s, I had a parishioner, well, many come to me and say, they have discovered hell. And there was an article that was published that in Russia they had been drilling something like 30 miles into the earth and they had actually heard screams. And these well-meaning people said, Pastor, you look at this, it's, it's, it's written, it's true. Well, I mean, I knew in a moment that it was nonsense, but it was a scam. So why would we take something like that public? You know, Jehovah's Witnesses will come to your door and they will also challenge you about heaven. Because we all believe that heaven is up there. And paradise, the third heaven is, but eternally, it talks about a new heaven and earth. All come becoming one. They are right. So to the degree that we argue differently, who looks foolish? Our own witness. We need to know these things. A few years back, we had a Good Friday service, and we had a guest in, and they showed, shared a children's story. They told the, the story of how uh, when Jesus was resurrected, and those who went in afterwards and saw the empty tomb saw the cloth folded. And according to uh, the customs of the time, the folding of a napkin or the folding of cloth means I will be back. It's a lie. It's not true. There's no custom. Somebody has fabricated that. <coughs> Microevolution versus macroevolution. We don't believe in macroevolution where God, uh, over the course of, of human history, has suddenly created a new um, kind of animal or species. But we all believe in microevolution. We do. Because there are subtle changes in terms of skin coloring and hair and, and things like that. Minor changes that have happened um, over time. And so it's not that we don't believe in evolution, it's that we, we don't believe in one component of evolution, but we naturally believe in another component. That's why we, we breed dogs. Two different species to make a different kind of, of dog. Uh, my mom has a what? Cockapoo? What is it? A ship a sh a sh Yeah, well, what's the difference? <laughs> it's something that was never intended when God created all the animals, but it's something we have done. It's microevolution in a sense. So sometimes we are so anxious, let's go back to the pelican and other things. Sometimes we're so anxious to warm our own hearts, we accept ideas without authenticating them. And there's no need for us to embellish the truth because God's truth stands on its own and needs no reinforcement. Needs no add-ons. It stands on its own. And for the sake of integrity with truth and credibility in our witness, there might be a few things that we need to unlearn. Some needs, sometimes we need to let go of what we think, go back and look again, and the legend of the pelican, if nothing else, teaches us that. But let's consider the pelican again. On a more positive note, what can the pelican teach us about God? After all, Jesus did say, consider the birds. So the pelican. Well, watching a pelican feed its young is kind of like a wild adventure. They will, a pelican will actually travel up to 60 miles in order to find food for its young. And then, let's say it finds a fish. It will eat the fish. It will fly to the nest, regurgitate the fish. And the young will actually dive into the pouch of the pelican, like almost right in, and they will fight to get that fish. And sometimes they will even commit fratricide. They will kill one another in order to eat. They have such voracious appetites. It's like they can't get enough. It's wild. And not only that, some young pelicans, they, they get so engrossed in feeding that they will just 
automatically faint. It's a common sign. They will just faint and appear dead on the ground. You say, I didn't come to church to hear about pelican signs. <laughs> but what could God be teaching us about himself through this? Could it be about an appetite for his word? I, I don't know. While pelicans are awkward looking winged creatures, when they're on the waves, skirting the waves, they can look incredibly graceful. Is that an image of humans being led by the Spirit? Awkwardness, finding a grace beyond itself? There is an image of a pelican that's far more profound. And maybe this one speaks about God and his character more than anything else. Consider the birds, Jesus said. Next one. Next one. Now we have a symbol that's based in more than make believe, but in the reality of our time. Remember the deep horizon oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico? Right there, pelicans emerged, drenched in what humans call black gold. So this dinosaur-like bird has in modern times become the unofficial symbol of environmental casualties. Jesus said, consider the birds. What does the pelican tell us? Of course, it tells us that humans are intent on destroying God's creation. But if the birds and all creation is somehow supposed to reflect the character, the, the image of God in some form. What is this telling us about God? Maybe, what type of oil slicks are we leak, leaking to hide the true nature of God from the world around us? In what ways are we covering up God? So that unbelievers, the unchurched, can't really see him. We know that the world is removing God from mainstream culture, prayer, removed from schools. I'm very fortunate that I still have a presence on campus, can pray on those occasions. That's rare. That doesn't happen at the main campus in Guelph. Imprinted on creation are the traces of God. Consider the birds, consider the pelican. To the degree that we don't pursue truth, are we the oil slip? I'm just asking questions. To the degree that we don't live out the Christian life the way Jesus prescribed it, are we the oil slip? After all, Aren't we the only Bible many people read? Aren't we the only Jesus people see? Many people see? Well, there's a product on the market called Dawn. It's supposed to help wash the oil off the animals that are covered in oil and tar. Maybe God is saying to us when we look at the pelican that we really need to be mindful to get out of the dawn. The Christian life is about projecting the good news and keeping it good. Our con conduct needs to be upright, our giving needs to be unselfish, our worship needs to be authentic and consistent. We're the only Bible, the only Jesus a lot of people see. Just think for a moment, one area of your life where you think 
you are reflecting the nature of Christ. One area where some of the oil needs to be washed off so people can see Jesus and be drawn to him. Consider the pelican. Consider the birds. Come and inquire of God's created world. And see what God says to you. Heavenly Father. As your Holy Spirit speaks to us each, perhaps on a different matter pertaining to our own life, may we have ears to hear that we might listen from the inside out and be transformed by your word. Help us to be those that do not tarnish your presence, but allow others to see you as you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.